if we're talking about the art that serves the French ducal courts, the Dukes of Burgundy, we have a spectacular example in the painting and sculpture for the site known as the Chartreuse de Champement. And the authors explain that this is a project that's re incredibly important to Philip the Bold, and he will spend tons of money on it. It is an entire monastery in the Carthusian order in the town of Champ Mall, which is close to his capital, Dijon. He acquires land for it. He begins building a church. He's spending tons of money because this will house the family tombs. The monks at this monastery, this Chartreuse de Champ Mall, they're going to be paying, excuse me, praying continuously for the souls of Philip and his family. So you can compare the importance of this to the Duke, for the Dukes of Burgundy to the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis for the French kings. Remember, Abbe Suger created this magnificent Gothic style there because that was the burial church of the French kings. And so we have a kind of all-out statement of art. Who does the Duke hire? Who, what serves his taste? Well, he gets an altarpiece, and you're going to see here that the altarpiece is being shown to you. It's by Melchior Broderlam. It's being shown to you for a couple of reasons. One is for its format, because it is a triptych. You go down here, and they explain diptych versus triptych. I introduced this in our last module. It's, these are folding altarpieces. As you read the textbook, you'll learn about what's shown on these outer panels, these painted outer panels. I want to show you what you see when you open them up. The interior is a shining golden world of delicate ornamentation, intricate decorativeness in carved wooden figures that have been gilded, covered with gold leaf to give the a sense of the three-dimensionality of the major scenes like the crucifixion and yet also the glorifying of those scenes by having them shine with golden light. You'll see later in the chapter that this combination of golden sculptural scenes with painted panels was a, a favorite style in the North. And in fact, the, the painted altarpieces were felt to be less magnificent than altarpieces that combined painting with sculptures like these. These were the, the most lavish and the most desirable. So of course the Duke wants the most lavish, the most magnificent form of altarpiece. And one of the things the textbook authors will do is to explain how the painted portions of his altarpiece are also of the most elegant style of the time. And so here they're describing the painting, the, the painted altarpiece, and they're explaining first the scene, the meaning, but they're also explaining that this is a great example of international Gothic. In international Gothic fashion, both the interior and exterior of the building are shown and the floors are tiled up at the back to give clear views of the action. So here's what they mean by the floors tiled up, right? They're explaining that there's a real deep space that this, these little doll houses have, but the floors seem to go up rather than back. I bring that up to make a contrast with what's going to be happening in Italy. When we move to the Italian Renaissance, you're gonna see that what's called linear perspective will be invented, where the lines really seem to go back, not up. And so I'm trying to make it clear in your mind that that's different than what you're seeing here in international Gothic. And so linear perspective won't be invented in Italy until about 25 years after Broderlam makes this painting. But that's not really the point. It's, he, it's not that he can't do linear perspective, he wants it this way. 
artists using international gothic, their goal is to cram as many delicate details in as possible to maximize the intensity and the glory of what you're looking at. So they want to be able to manipulate the perspective in a shifting way so that they can have, you can feel like you're looking inward to see microscopic details like the tiny little details of the tile on the floor in here, but also the macroscopic forms like the, the giant mountains reaching up and moving back so, back so that you can see an individual tile in the architecture, but also the whole architecture. That's their preference. The textbook authors switch then from painting to sculpture, although here, look at the altarpiece. It is, of course, part sculpture, as we just said, and you see it here displayed behind the tomb of Philip the Bold, the patron. So the main sculptor, whose name survives, is Klaus Sluder, and they talk about his work by showing this remaining piece of what's called the Well of Moses. So some of these uh, artistic elements from Duke Philip's burial place were either moved and, and, and or looted or destroyed in the French Revolution. So we're not seeing everything intact. They are going to lead you through these sculptures to understand that this was hugely significant, both in terms of the realism that Sluter attained the un incredible realistic quality of the faces and the fact that the realism was enhanced by these sculptures being painted to look even more realistic and they're going to explain to you that in making them so so realistic they say with the vigorous imposing and highly individualized individualized figures Sluter abandoned the idealized faces, elongated figures, and vertical drapery of international Gothic. So they're telling you that in this place, there's an established style again, the international Gothic, and there's something new emerging, something different. You have more than one approach being used. This is similar to what you saw in Siena and Florence when you saw the Pisano brothers kind of pioneering a more three-dimensional, more naturalistic art. And so, again, we can really see this best when we look at the bodies, the kinds of bodies. These solid, hefty bodies have a, quite, a, kind, of, a, a kind of human reality that you don't see in the International Gothic. Let me show you an example. This painted page comes from a manuscript that we're going to look at next, an incredible and important artwork. But I'm showing it to you really to cl for the close-up it offers of the figures and how well they fit into your textbook's description of international Gothic. They talk about slender, elegant figures with beautifully coiffed hair and elaborate headdresses this is it, right? Look at those dainty, long fingers and gestures. These are courtly people. These are ladies in waiting to courtly duchesses and countesses who are showing their prestige, their elegance, and their good manners as aristocratic people. So already we're seeing a tension between two possible styles related to two identities based in social class.